Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. And like I always say, go back to episode one. Listen to all old good ones. So much information there. A lot of hard work went into every episode. So please go back and listen to them. There's so much of a story to be told. You can see the whole journey that I've been on. Learn a lot along the way. I think there really is a health journey and it's not a straight path. It changes. You learn things. You try new things. And that's where we are today. Today with Kate Deering. She is in the pro-metabolic crowd, which is similar to Jay Feldman. They all call it different things. Bioenergetic, whatever it is, it's sort of an ancestral diet with more carbs in it. She believes in organ meats, in raw milk, in quality animal proteins, in quality animal fats, avoiding seed oils, avoiding refined grains, avoiding processed foods. All of it is great stuff. This camp just believes that carbs and glucose help your body work more efficiently, get those mitochondria working. It's really interesting stuff. A lot of people I know are doing it, adding more carbs, feeling great, eating more fruit, eating some sweet potatoes, honey, feeling great, not gaining any weight. My sleep is getting better. My temperature is raising. It's very interesting. Just a quick name drop here. <laughs> I was talking to a Food Lies fan world-famous DJ Calvin Harris. Saw him comment on a few of my posts and realized he was following me. Realized he's in great shape. Realized he's into regenerative ag. And I had to talk to him. We had a nice conversation on Instagram about how he eats, how he stays fit. And guess what? It's a pro-metabolic diet. It's what we're talking about today with Kate Deering. He's into organ meats. He's into the raw milk. He's into all the animal foods and he's into regenerative ag as well. He's into raising the animals properly. And he told me I could talk about it, but he said that he did not want to come on a podcast and share this stuff openly because he might get canceled. Who knows? The woke mob out there is crazy. He has a big career at risk, so doesn't want to talk about it publicly, but said I could. So I just thought that was interesting that he does this pro-metabolic approach and that he's all about regenerative ag and wants to get some land and raise some animals and do all the good things. So that's pretty cool. A little bit more about Kate Deering. She brings 25 years of experience in the holistic health and wellness space, along with a robust and tested approach to healing someone, nutritionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. With a dense background in sports performance, biochemistry, and physiology, Kate has recently shifted her thoughts on what true health meant, focusing on a more root cause, holistic approach towards optimal health, while also writing the book, How to Heal Your Metabolism. She often is associated with the likes of Ray Pete and Jay Feldman, embracing fruit, sugar, and carbs as a natural and fundamental source of energy, focusing on the underlying issues that leads to intolerances in handling carbohydrates. I've gotten some pushback with these episodes. Some people are very scared of carbohydrates. They think they're the cause of all their problems. I don't think this is the case from day one. I was saying the problems are refined grains, seed oils, added sugar. This is not what they're advocating for. They're saying eat a clean whole foods diet, fix your metabolism, and then you can handle carbohydrates. It might be a longer road. You might need to exercise more. You might not be able to just do lazy keto and get by. It may take more work. You may need to heal your gut. But if you're eating clean, heal your metabolism, I think it could work for a lot of people. Maybe not for everyone. That's fine. Don't do it if you don't want. I could definitely see how this would be a problem for some people. They just healed themselves from the standard American diet and eating many times per day. And now these people are saying they should go back to eating carbs and eating meals many times a day. I can see how it's not for everyone at all. But if you're focused in and want to learn more about this approach, please listen to this episode. Even if you're against it, please listen to it anyway. Go back to the Jay Feldman one. Go back to the other ones I did. Did one with Tomo Littlewood, Keith Littlewood. There was a debate with Kate Deering and Dr. Jamie Seaman. Just go back and listen to the episodes, get the full picture. So before we begin, got to talk about Nose the Tail. Nosetail.org. Get your grass-fed regenerative meat. We are back shipping. We've had some major problems with the heat wave, but we're back. Please support us. It's been a really tough couple months here, and we need your support. Get all your great products, the Biltong, the Body Care. We got soaps and skin food made of beef tallow. We got lip balm made of beef tallow. This is great stuff, handmade by Tommy, regenerative. We got the dried meat, the biltong. We get the liver vores, get that liver mixed into your snack. Just meat, a little bit of vinegar and spices, that's it. We got seasonings. Man, the tongue tide is so good. The dill is amazing. Still use the dill every day in my yogurt. Basically makes a ranch dressing. Get your hats. And of course, get all the meat, make a big box, get it sent to you. Notesatail.org, 
Thanks so much for your support. Join the Sapien newsletter at sapien.org. Get all the updates there. Just had a long day working on the film. It's going great. It's so fun trying to put together this puzzle. It's an unbelievable amount of work, but I love doing it. It's going to be a masterpiece. The six-part series will be on a big platform at some point in the future. Check out the intro on the Food Lies YouTube channel. Three and a half minutes. Took over a year and a half. Please support us. Foodlies.org. And check out nosetail.org. And thanks for listening. Enjoy this one with Kate Daring. Hey, hey. We're on with Kate Daring. How's it going? It's going well, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome back. We did a podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. It was a bit of a debate, a pretty friendly debate. We got we went back and forth <laughs> on some things. I don't know if we got uh, anywhere. We we got a lot done. I think a lot of interesting topics covered. But maybe maybe what was your opinion? I think we got some things accomplished. I definitely had a lot of people reach out to me after that uh, who tr decided to add some carbohydrates in maybe specific times in their day or um, that things started to make sense to them or it was just diff it was just nice to see kind of where we came into agreement and where the disagreement was. So I think it was at least educational. Well, it's great. People can go back and listen. Dr. Jamie Seaman represented you know, ancestral foods, but more of a fat based approach. And Kate, pretty much the same. There's a lot of overlap. And I can tell you what that is in a second. But with a more maybe carb as fuel base. So we both agree on these superfoods that are just ancestral health foods that we've always eaten and, you know, meat and organs and you know, just just real foods, right? So we all agree on the real foods. We all agree that PUFAs and seed oils are bad. And then we can get into some of the other nuances. But generally, that's what we agree on. Is there other things that we kind of agree on? Plus the lifestyle stuff, right? All the great lifestyle, sleep and sun and exercise. Yeah. I mean, movement is good. Obviously, you know, sitting in front of a screen all day long. I mean, all the all these modern things that we've had that are in our lives maybe aren't the best for us and trying to find ways to mitigate these stress responses um, in different ways. I mean, I think we look at physiology and what may be happening a little bit differently, but, um, and I think it, like I said, it always depends on the individual and what is going on with them, maybe what works best for them, depending on their goals, their needs and, and, and their health. Mm -hmm. So do you have kind of a thesis? We were talking before about what is this even called? And I like that you have, it's, it's a framework. It's not, you know, a diet, but. I, when I started learning this, I always looked at it as a framework. It was more of like a concept of, you know, finding where you are and, and trying to figure out what you need at that stage of healing and depending on where you're at, because I think it's different for everybody. I think, you know, we are in a world where we want to label it. So it's certainly, you can hear it labeled as the bioenergetic uh, diet, the pro-metabolic diet. Some people call it the Ray Pete diet because a lot of the information is based on his uh, philosophies. Um, ultimately, he would say none of those things. I mean, to him, it's always about, you know, everything is different depending on the individual and where they're at and what's available to them and what they can handle. And so to label it a diet, because we usually think of a diet as a certain way of eating and that's how we follow it. But this is this can change based on somebody's healing and as they get better and maybe something that worked in the past maybe not might not be ideal later on or vice versa. So again, it all depends on where that individual is at, is where we or where I would approach them and try to get them and meet their body where it's at. And then as they get a little bit better, you might change things accordingly. But just to saying, here, do this, make, you know, which a lot of people do, they get into this approach and say, oh, lots of sugar and ice cream and milk and all of these things. And they came from this completely different approach and get all these negative, you know, things happen to them. And obviously that isn't going to work. We have to figure out where is your starting point and then move you accordingly to how your body is healing. Yeah, definitely a framework. And we need to call it something, like you said, we need to call it something. And I just wanted to know what that is because it is a different way of eating even though there's many ways of eating under this umbrella so i guess we can just call it the pro metabolic or bioenergetic i don't know i kind of switch in between those as a general descriptor of yes. what this is and yeah i repeat does um get some credit for like some of this right absolutely yeah a, a, a large percentage i would say because a lot of the framework comes from his uh research 
And I mean, obviously a lot of other people and he's utilized other people like Han Sele. And so there's a lot of thoughts that, or people that go into this approach and then it's kind of utilizing their research. And then, then from my perspective, it's also just utilizing a lot of work with clients to see, you know, the nuances with what does work with people, depending on what is going on with them. What is, what, are, what, what they can handle? What are they doing? Where did they come from? What diet were they previously consuming before this? So, um, I do like it's like an energy approach because the the entire philosophy is to improve energy production. So I, I guess good, I would try to go to that bioenergetic space. Bioenergetic. And I actually just did a podcast with Jay Feldman, who has his own spin and works with patients and yeah, calls it the energy balance or that's the podcast or something. It's, something, it's just all around production of energy and maximizing that. And yes. so, yeah, well, maybe you could recap some of Ray Pete's work. Just for yeah, people who don't even know who that is. Well, I think Ray comes from a perspective, again, of trying to produce energy production, um, you know, or basically trying to pr produce increased metabolism. And that basically comes from you turning your food into energy. And that can come from improving digestion, improving absorption, making sure that the foods you're consuming have a high nutrient uh, content, because that's super important. Um, in glucose metabolism, a high variety of nutrition is needed to make sure that that's optimal. Um, he's always coming from a perspective of also increasing things like carbon dioxide because we need we know that carbon dioxide is needed to facilitate oxygen getting into the tissue, which I think people probably from the fat is energy approach don't seem to talk about at all. And so he is always looking at where in the organism could there be an energy breakdown? Is it because your body can't break food down and you're not able to turn it into fuel through digestion? Are you not absorbing it because you maybe have some sort of bacterial load in the GI system? Under, If you are under too much stress, too, all of those things are going to be downregulated. And so we have to take everything into consideration and not just what food you're eating. And again, it's can you digest it? And then once it gets into the blood system, are you able to turn that energy into energy for yourself? Are you able to turn that food into energy and produce heat and carbon dioxide and water, all the things that we would produce in cellular metabolism? And so I, he looks at all of those pieces and then assesses them based on, again, the person, because not everybody is going to be functioning the same way. Mm. Yeah. It, it gets all the way down to the ATP production. So what else? And, and when did he get into the, the PUFA stuff and specifically how bad these are and, and then, you know, the seed oils, which have just a really high concentration of these PUFAs? I think you know, Ray has probably been talking that? about PUFAs for 30, 40 years. Um, I couldn't tell you his specific date as when he probably started to see that they were creating a problem, but it's definitely been a long period of time where he's talked about, you know, one, how they can interrupt protein digestion and interrupt cellular metabolism and have so many negative effects on the system um, through the entire uh, space of trying to produce energy. And, and I think he saw that early on that the saturated fats were more protective, protective. I mean, the guy's 86 now, I think. So, you know, I think he initially started studying hormones and particularly like women's hormones and progesterone and estrogen, uh, and then started to realize, Hey, maybe those aren't just women hormones, particularly estrogen. And then started to, study stress in conjunction to the, the, the human body was looking at like Hans Seeley's work because he started to study or his whole work was based on stress. And I think started to realize, okay, what, when we look at, at a body and see how it produces energy, it can be produced via high thyroid function. We produce a lot of energy and then we're in a more relaxed state or through stress where we can also produce a lot of energy or waste a lot of energy but we're not in a relaxed state. That's more of that anxiety driven or even fatigue state, but can also be very wasteful and burn a lot of calories, but not in the way we want, meaning they're all externally burning versus internally utilized to produce energy or digestion and so forth, all the functions of our system. So I think he always talks about like a stressed organism versus a high energy uh, organism, which is more of an organism that's in that restful state. And I think that's not talked about a lot. And people just look at energy expenditure and go, well, you're burning a lot of calories and it's always about energy in, energy out. And that's what's going to produce the result for when we talk in the context of weight loss. But he takes it a, a whole nother level and says, yes, you can burn a lot of energy 
if you're in that stress state and burn a lot of calories and so forth. But if you put that person in the resting state, what is their physiology doing? Are they able to digest food? Can they sleep? How do they feel? Do they have, you know, restful energy through the day or they're more anxious and have poor digestion and poor sleep? And so it's trying to correct those imbalances so that they can actually internally use more energy for their functions versus just externally wasting it via the stresses that happen in your day to day. Yeah, that's really great, actually, to get into those details. Stress is kind of a broad term. Can you kind of tell us a little more what that means in this context? I would say in energy production context, I would say stress is when your body can't meet its demand. So anytime you have excess demands versus what your body's able to produce energetically. And when there is a difference, so your demands on your body are much higher than what your body is able to produce versus the food it's consuming then you can elicit a stress response. And usually that's your body's response and saying, okay, you aren't giving us enough fuel or we aren't able to produce enough energy to keep up with you. So we're going to start either breaking your tissue down or releasing fat or whatever it is to give you enough fuel to try to keep you alive or to keep you to doing what you need to be doing. At the same time, when we go into that response, your body's also very protective. So it says, well, if you're going to stress us and put more demands on us that we can manage, we're also going to lower your metabolism or your internal functions so that we can deal with all these external things that are happening around you. So I just think it's more of an energy balance when I reference stress, like, cause anything, um, you know, we can, re we can references. It's just saying like you have work stress or emotional stress or, um, workout can be considered a stress because it's an energy demand. But if our body is able to balance that or has enough usable energy to keep up with that, then it doesn't foresee it as much as a stressor on the system. It's not going to have that catabolic effect um, versus if a, a system is underfueled, it doesn't have enough energy and you try to put it through a really, really hard workout. Well, then you're going to get a more of a stress response because now your body has to find resources somewhere and it's usually starting to start addressing and breaking down your own tissue to meet its demands. Mm. It's interesting because I, I think there's kind of this pendulum swinging thing that always happens with diet stuff. And then and then there's these every three to five years, there's new ones. And I think maybe the, the keto and this like doing exercise fasted and then doing like, you know, 10 other things like cold plunge and sauna. It's just like maybe too much stress. So people got the idea of autophagy and hormetic stress and that it could be good for you. But are, is the kind of pro-metabolic or bioenergetic idea that it's kind of overboard and that we have enough stresses or stressors in our life already and that we're kind of doing too much with these diets that are and, and is that like some people would say well I have enough fuel it's I'm fueled by fat and I can do a fasted workout you know and still have energy so I, I think it depends on the person and their physiology, right? If you flipped your switch and you're now a fat burner and you're utilizing that as fuel, you might say that. But anytime we start being becoming a fat burner, there is a level of adaptation that occurs in the body where A, we start producing less carbon dioxide and B, there's a, just a metabolic adaptation where we start slowing metabolic rate. Um, so we have ad adaptations that do occur and they might... And and for the most part, though, thyroid function doesn't care how much body fat you have. So some people are like, well, if you're going to start utilizing your body as energy, it would be nice to say, I'm just use all my fat and not utilize any of my protein or any, or any of my muscle as fuel. And that's quite hard to achieve. Um, you're going to still have to regulate blood sugar. So you, your body needs sugars somewhere. And if you're not giving it to it, it's going to start breaking down your tissue to get it. Now, if you're going completely ketogenic... Um, it's going to really minimize that. But again, that's going to come at some level of price because the, using ketos as energy is coming into more of a survival technique in my, or survival to your system because other parts of your body thrive better utilizing glucose as energy, particularly your brain. Of course, I'm sure they could argue differently, but how your brain uses, uses resources is always going to be the biggest consumer of glucose. It prefers that energy long term. So I think going back to the question of uh, excess energy, um, I think producing or having a high thyroid function initially before trying to become into a fat burner is more ideal 
than just trying to burn a ton of fat off your body without assessing your current state of health. And so if you continually add stress upon stress upon stress upon stress, yes, we can stress fat, right? In fact, going into beta oxidation is a stress response. We're starting to utilize fat as fuel as a primary source of energy. That is a stress response. Um, so again, it comes with adaptations. And if we continually just add stress upon stress, fasting, you know, cold plunges, all of these additional things we're adding onto our system. And if that person is already stressed, they have a high uh, a stressful job, relationship stress, it might not tax them initially a lot. Again, it depends on the, the person, but it's going to start playing a role. And I see it all the time, whether they're starting to do that over a year or two years or six months or whatever it is, things start to go sideways. They might start to lose their hair. They start to have poor GI function. Um, a series of other things start happening from the adaptation perspective because they've been living in this kind of stress response for long periods of time. Their performance might decrease. Their sleep might decrease. So all of those happen in time, in my experience. And so adding more stressors onto their system doesn't seem like an ideal thing to do. Again, some people come into this approach and like they think that we're thinking, don't exercise, don't do anything, <laughs> just do nothing. And that's not at all certainly what I'm saying. It's finding out what your body can manage and handle and still heal. If you're, my perspective and my goal is always to get someone to become a better glucose user. I want them to utilize energy better from a carbohydrate standpoint because I know when they do, things improve. And so sleep improves, skin and hair improves body temperature and pulse improve. All of these things that I can measure, I can see to get better. And ultimately, as we're going through that healing stage, fat loss might not be what happens initially. In fact, for some people, there can be some fat gain or, you know, depending on how fast they go. Um, and for some is needed, for others, not so much. So that's why you have to take a, a consideration of to what they're consuming um, what are their what are their macros? Certainly, how much calories and energy they're consuming overall? Because if you do overconsume, you are going to gain. So, I think the biggest argument, like the crux of the argument between the keto people and the bioenergetic people, is whether burning ketones and fat is a stress state, a stress state, or a stress has you know stress hormones that are released, or is stressful in general, or not. Is that because th there's a lot of overlap and, th and that leads to, you know, why you want glucose as a fuel instead of the fat or ketones. So what is the evidence that this is the more stressful state for the body? Because the keto crowd, I'm again, I'll just throw it out. I I'm just like the, the observer here. I'm into just whole foods and I like the ancestral approach. And I think we may have had more fat throughout history or more times where we had to rely on fat. So that's why I'm asking is, is why would that be a stressful state? Do you think that's like we're starving? I think the, the, the main reason why that by utilizing fat as fuel is more stressful is the decreased amount of carbon dioxide it produces. Primarily glucose, utilizing glucose as energy is going to produce double the amount of carbon dioxide. And I think certainly in the medical space, I think they seem carb carbon dioxide as a waste product. Versus if you actually see when we use, when we produce it, it, it is actually used to facilitate oxygen getting into the tissue. So we utilize ox more oxygen in aerobic respiration. So we increase cellular respiration with oxygen available. I think sometimes I, I see there's a comparison with like utilizing ketones and gly glycolysis. And they're saying, well, burning ketones produces more energy than glycolysis because there's only to ATP producing glycolysis. But if you actually look at the entirety of cellular respiration, there's 36 to 38 ATP, and it's actually produced at a quite high rate, whereas ketones, I think, is like 24, 26. So the energy production is actually higher utilizing glucose. And again, when we start utilizing ketones and fat, our carbon dioxide production actually goes down. And so, again, that's something that I don't ever see addressed in the ketogenic world. I don't ever see them talking about carbon dioxide and how important it is and how it's actually used as an antioxidant and for other many, a lot of other properties that we utilize it for. And I think because, again, in the medical space, you know, if somebody has um, a lung issue and they can't 
get rid of carbon dioxide, you know, they might have some sort of respiratory acidosis and they have high CO2 in their blood. And in the medical community, they're trying to waste it and get it out of their system. But that's not because of a production issue. That's more because of a respiratory issue. And so I think that has to be addressed when you actually talk in the context of energy production. And so that's one of the big reasons why glucose is recommended. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever heard many other people talking about CO2 and and you did give us some of that information on why it's better, but maybe you could just tell people one more time or kind of give us a a different picture of why this is a good thing and how it works. Well, again, when you are producing glucose in the energy, you will produce double the carbon dioxide in the cell for you to get oxygen into the cell to be utilized for cellular respiration, you need carbon dioxide. Without it, oxygen cannot get into the tissue. So they refer to it as the Bohr effect at the, at the cell. So it's where your cells are essentially breathing. There's this exchange of gases that occurs. It, it occurs at the lungs, right? When you exhale carbon dioxide and breathe in oxygen, and then it occurs at the cell level when we release carbon dioxide and bring in oxygen. If that is lower, then we don't get as much oxygen into the tissue. And so that's going to slow down respiration and actually push someone into glycolysis, which is that anaerobic state with, without oxygen, right? And that's very wasteful. That produces lactic acid, right? And we don't produce a lot of energy in that state. That's the, what you would see in a diabetic individual. Um, so the goal would be to actually do something that's going to produce more, and that is increasing the body's ability to utilize glucose as energy. Of course, there are some people, obviously, that cannot utilize glucose properly, then which would be the diabetic individual. Whether it's stuck in their, their cells or they just can't get it into their cells, then they're going to have a different problem. Um, and so that also comes back to you remove glucose from that person's diet, or do you try to improve or figure out why they are unable to utilize glucose properly? So the CO2, so I remember back in organic chemistry, back in engineering school, there was a rate determining step. And if you have your balancing equation of using, and you have different molecules on each side, and if you only have a certain amount of, say, CO2 on one side of the equation, you can only make so much of this compound because that's the rate determining step or, or rate limiting step, or it's something around there. I should have looked it up beforehand, but you know what I mean? It's like, you need this much to make this much. Is that what you're saying happens with the oxygen? If you don't have enough CO2, it's, it's well, like you, you can, can't. Yeah, you can't facilitate it getting into the, I mean, I don't know if you will, it, there is a rate limiting effect, but yeah. So if you don't have much CO2, you cannot facilitate oxygen getting into the tissue. If you have less oxygen, you're not going to increase or improve like cellular respiration is going to slow down because you do need oxygen in so many places for your body to produce energy. So if that's not there, then everything else is going to slow down. And again, then we can push our system into glycolysis, which is that anaerobic place where we don't need it. That's that quick energy place. That's when we would sprint or so forth. We actually don't need oxygen. We can get those. But as a side note, we will produce more lactic acid in that space, which can also be good. We need it it's utilized properly, but we don't want to stay in that place. We don't want to constantly be producing a lot of lactic acid because that's going to put another burden on our body. Mm. And then what about the ketogenic crowd saying that it's a cleaner, like ketones would be a cleaner burning fuel source and that there's less reactive oxygen species or, or did they say it's more? I don't, and yeah. it's a good thing? I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, I, I haven't really seen that, that that glucose is gonna increase in the context of a healthy individual. Maybe in someone that is ill, that could be a possibility. Um, so I mean, I don't I have to look at the study and what's referenced and who's what what they're doing to say that this is happening, but I don't see that that as something that is actually true. So then you mentioned in type two diabetics, they cannot use glucose well. So how do you think that process works, right? How, how does someone become type 2 diabetic in your model? And how would someone reverse that if possible? So I, working with people that are type 2 and seeing people that go, that kind of be pushed in that diabetic state, it, I don't ever perceive that it's because they're over consuming. I mean, they can just be over consuming calories or whatever. But most of those individuals are stressed some way, somehow. And so... 
in our model, you're usually going to see it as cortisol being one of the factors or a high cortisol state or a high adrenaline state. Something is preventing that individual um, that is, I shouldn't say preventing, but they're essentially their body is maybe unable to continue to regulate blood sugar. They're constantly going into a stress response. So their body is shuttling in between utilizing sugar and fat as energy. Every time they go into the stress response, their body starts liberating fat into the blood. They're breaking down tissue to help regulate themselves. And the more and, and the more you do that, the more it happens. Then they're just unable to keep things regulated. And those are the same people that maybe aren't eating regularly. Maybe they're skipping meals. Maybe they're eating crappy food. I mean, maybe they're eating foods high in polyunsaturated fats. I think there's a lot of nuances that will be contributing to the diabetic state, but certainly living in that stress state is a big one. Um, obviously, just over-consuming and eating a high amount of polyunsaturated fats because of the way that the polyunsaturated fats might affect the pancreas and its ability to produce insul insulin can be affected, but uh, that is certainly a factor. I mean, it, when you work with someone, there's certainly things that I would do first, right? What first, certainly take out any processed foods and just start getting this person regular meals throughout the day to seeing how well they can manage blood sugar and can that help regulate them. Um, if they're unable to utilize the energy still and you start to see super really high blood sugar levels, then I would definitely look at the fat content. I find that having both of those too high, too much fat and too much carbohydrates or sugar at one time, they seem to uh, the fat seems to hinder the ability for that person to utilize sugar or carbohydrates. So it tends to stay in their blood too long and will appear as high blood sugar. Um, I think also those people are in a state of glycolysis on some level because I think the, the sugar is getting into the cell. It's just not able to go through this full process of utilizing and producing energy. So it, again, it stays in glycolysis. They might be producing lactic acid. They're not getting good energy production. So they can be eating but still feel like complete garbage and they don't have enough energy. And so again, we have to look at a lot of different spaces along the track to see where is, where is this person broken that might be producing this result? And is it this, they're unable to absorb certain nutrients? Maybe they can't get enough absolute nutrients in to help utilize these carbohydrates. So B1 in particular is one of the nutrients that we need double the amounts when we are utilizing carbohydrates to break them down. Other nutrients, copper, zinc, magnesium, a diet is really, really low in those. Those could be uh, the factor that might be hindering their ability to utilize carbohydrates as energy. Because carbs, because they are quite metabolic, utilize a lot of nutrients. So a diet that might be high in carbs and low in nutrition can produce a lot of negative effects. So both of those have to go together. And that's why it is preferred to always utilize these high nutrient dense foods, you know, particularly in animal foods, um, because they are more bioavailable. Their nutrition is more bioavailable and they're all needed to help cellular respiration occur on so many places during the cycle. Um, so we would, I would always look at your stress um, from a diabetic perspective. Um, because again, if that person is just stressed and, and unable to, and is not eating all day because usually stress in itself is going to kill your appetite. So half these people aren't eating breakfast. They're not eating anything. They're waiting all day to eat something. They might eat a little bit of meat, little, a little uh, lunch. And then by the time they get home and they're getting out of their stress life, they eat, you know, 2000 calories <laughs> or whatever before they go to bed. And all of that is just going to create this vicious cycle on them, right? They can't man handle that amount of food. It's all going to raise in their blood sugar is going to go up high. They're going to store it all because they can't utilize it. And so we're going to try to balance that, get them into more balanced meals, um, balancing it with some carbs, fat, and protein, depending on where, what they can manage. Again, some people can't utilize uh, a, a good amount of carbs and fat at the same time. So for some people, going pretty low fat seems to really benefit them and will help bring their blood sugars down. Um, for some people, they can stay at 30% fat and, and be fine. Others, I got to get them down to 10 to 15% fat for them to see a significant shift. And so that seems to help correct them. Of course, there's other things like using high potassium foods seem to help because that can help facilitate sugar getting into the cell without the use of insulin. Um, using something like glycine to help regulate blood sugars is super helpful. So adding the bone broths, gelatin, collagen, or even glycine into their diet is super helpful. Um, but also just addressing the stress, too much stress that again, which is me cannot meet their energetic demands. So sometimes we just need to lower the load.
So, okay, a lot to break down. The stress makes a lot of sense because say if you, there's, you know, studies, simple studies showing that if you don't sleep enough or, you know, yeah, dysregulated sleep or circadian rhythm, your blood sugar will go out of control, right? And you can you eat the same 100%. thing. 100%. Yeah, right? So that makes sense to everyone. It's like, if you're not sleeping and you're in this bad state, then your your whole metabolism gets screwed up. And but then on the other side, well, you're talking about your strategy is almost the opposite that works for so many people that I know and so many doctors that I've interviewed. Not saying that yours doesn't work or that they're they're wrong or either person is wrong. It's just interesting that you're saying this is a stressful way to live when people I know, even good friends of mine that I don't know, they lost like 80 pounds and they're doing amazing. And that's the one intervention they did do was I just didn't I just ate a small lunch or no lunch and ate a big meal and completely changed their life and off blood, you know, blood pressure medication, all these things, you know, lost 80 pounds, all this stuff. So, so I mean, yeah, maybe are you saying some people can do that? Some people can't, is it just what they're eating? Cause I, you could, you could probably say all that matters is what they're eating though. Cause they, some people could just not eat all day, not be at all fat adapted, but trying to do that sort of diet. And then it is really stressful if your body's not at all ready for that type of diet and you're eating the wrong foods when you do eat. Well, I think a lot of it depends on where the person came from, right? So if you were just over consuming calories and putting on weight and you were eating bad sources of calories, and let's say you just put somebody on a even a low calorie diet, right? It can improve their markers. I mean, on some level, when we look at just putting someone in a calorie deficit and having them lose weight, that, it can that, well, that will improve their markers. So we can get someone somewhere from A to B and have them lose weight. The question is, can they maintain that for the next two to five to 10 years in that current diet? That's always my approach. Is that diet approach setting them up to that they can now utilize and keep their calories at a decent space? Or are they going to eventually in three, four, five years start to have other negative effects happen to them? I think any diet can probably work if it's in a deficit for a year or two because we're creating a deficit. And for some people, they're just over consuming. And for the people that are over consuming, then maybe, maybe on some level, they don't even have any metabolic issues. I mean, they might have issues as far as, you know, maybe they're not utilizing sugar as well or so forth, but um, they're not, their body ha doesn't have other issues. Maybe they don't have digestive issues. Maybe they're able to utilize the energy. You're just over consuming. So under consuming can improve those. In any way, just it could be high fat, it could be high carb, it could be vegan. Uh, any no, of yeah. those can get that result for the short term. Well, and, no, I know yeah. what you mean, and I because I I make those jokes too that like yeah anything can work. You go on a potato diet and lose weight, but that doesn't mean it's a good diet. And no, no I appreciate that. But then, and a lot of people do do this for many years, and then they feel great and they love. They're like, yeah, I just eat a bunch of steak and food I like and you know whatever side dishes it's not like they're carnivore but it's you know they're eating good foods and they're like yeah I just am hungry once a day before we move on I just want to yeah I mean and I again and I think so I think like context is always important right depending on that, where that person came from some people and I see this and if you're a healthy individual I think you can probably put any of these stressors on your system and be totally fine and you might be able to do them for a period of time be totally fine um, are there things that might be happening underneath the hood that we don't know about until all of a sudden you do know about them? Possibly. Um, in my experience, I have talked to individuals that have done fasting, have done carnivore, have done keto. And of course, right, everybody is probably working with different people that things have worked until they didn't. <laughs> because yes, <laughs> fasting and not eating all day long, is that a stress on your body? Yeah. But if somebody's eating 5,000 calories and can't utilize 5,000 and can only utilize 3,000, and now they're fasting and eating one meal a day and that meal is 2,000 calories, now they're in a 3,000 calorie deficit and they start losing weight and that, and that marker in itself can make a lot of things look better. And I think you know because most of the research on weight loss is pretty short term, they're not two, three, five, 10 year studies for the most part, there's very few that actually following these people, like maybe the biggest loser, like think they're following them for periods of time has shown. And we've seen that they have metabolic adaptations long after they've gone through these extreme weight loss. Um, so again, I, I'm not going to sit here and argue with someone that say, I feel good on this. I'm, okay. 
if that makes you feel good and that works for you and maybe your lifestyle because you don't have time or whatever, cool. It will work maybe forever. I don't think it will. Or it'll work till it doesn't. And then you have to then unpack maybe what has happened. And then at that point in time, if they are having blood sugar. So to me, a good diet is one that's going to get you to a place where you should be able to literally use eat almost everything with very poor uh, effects. And I mean, not all the time, but there always should be a little bit of movement that you can have things that you aren't, there aren't ideal and be totally fine. And if your very diet doesn't poor. let you get to that space, meaning if all you can eat is meat, and if you don't only eat meat, things go to shit, <laughs> then I would question that diet. <laughs> oh, I'm right there yeah. with you. Absolutely. Uh, I want to be anti-fragile and I want to, yeah, not be able to freak out if, if, you know, I'm at a social event and someone hands me as like, oh, I made this amazing cheesecake. I'm like, give me the cheesecake. I love it. I, I'm Absolutely. all about that. Yeah. So no, I agree with you. Absolutely. And no, I, I, I do agree with you too, because I've seen things go bad, right? They, people do do this they could do OMAD, they could do high meat, high fat OMAD for a couple of years. And then I've, you know, maybe they can't sleep. They have, they're cold. They, you know, have all, any number of problems. And I do think they're, or they can only eat a certain amount of calories. I kind of did a lot of this stuff with Jay Feldman. Just, we kind of talked through, hopefully this is not just a repeat. No, I think this is all like way different and, and interesting talking to Kate, but you could, I see the problems and I see maybe they can only eat, they kind of downregulate their metabolism and now they can only eat like 1400 calories a day. And if they eat more than that, they'll gain weight because they're just so accustomed to doing this specific like OMAD style diet. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a hard way to live in today's world, right? I think food does, should be enjoyed, right? We should have so a lot of different experiences in our life and if all you can ever eat is meat. And maybe people would argue like I'm fine with it. I can eat and do whatever. I'm like, okay, you know, do you, um, mm -hmm. again, not arguing with someone that is working for, it. I'm just look that it's working for you. I'm just looking at it from a different perspective, right? Can you break meat down and utilize it as fuel? Sure. Can it come with a lot of side effects long term? Yes, right? I mean, so it can definitely, we, we aren't as, although we can break down protein and utilize it as fuel. And of course, you know, protein would be the only macronutrient that we absolutely need to have. But does it mean it is the only macronutrient that we should have? Um, we should have these other resources. And carbs are very protein sparing. And we have enough. We won't break down protein. And A, it's cheaper. But A, it's just better for our system. There's a lot of waste when we break down protein and utilize it as fuel. And so, again, can it be utilized as a tool? Like I, I like to sometimes increase people's protein depending on what they're trying to achieve. Sometimes if they're in more of a fat loss phase and their body is healthy, we do increase protein and we probably do break down some utilize this energy purposely because I know I get a, a higher thermogenic energy production from that food than carbs or fat. So we can utilize it as a tool, but I don't put them in that space all the time. I like to kind of cycle people and where they're going in their diets. And sometimes, yeah, we want to put them in more carbohydrate and, or depending on if the individual is super stressed or super low thyroid function. Um, I don't want to give them a ton, ton of protein because that in, in itself can be thyroid suppressing. And so I think there's always this balance that you have to work with an individual. And I'm always coming from an energy perspective and how to support thyroid function and how to produce energy optimally so that we don't have to go into those stress cycles as often. Because I think that's where all disease is under stress, degeneration, right? When we go into those catabolic states too often and we see it as people age, right? They just become frail and bones break down and tissue breaks down and they lose muscle. That starts to happen at a more rapid rate. And we want to, I'm always trying to push them over into the space where let's do everything we can to mitigate that. What do we need to do? And, and consuming tons and tons of protein doesn't seem like a good idea to me because I know that it can have some negative effects on thyroid and energy production. Yeah. Well, every, yeah, everyone knows probably listening about gluconeogenesis and the, the idea is maybe we don't want to make your body make glucose. You know what I mean? It's like, why not just give it glucose? And that's kind of, yeah, what we're, we're kind of circling around here is like, what is the optimum way to eat and to fuel your body and make energy and get nutrients? And I've always been thinking about this. It's like, well, that's all the big question of nutrition, right? That's like the, the quest. It's like the holy grail. It's like, how do we feed ourselves 
properly and what are you know ancestrally and what our bodies want and yeah the uh, i'm not scared of protein there's also you said the thermic defect you know there's a high tef of protein there there is always a lot of nutrients that come along with protein there's also satiety right you can get like long lasting satiety from protein but okay you what what protein do we want plants or animals <laughs> animals right <laughs> I, i'll answer for you maybe yes you, <laughs> I would say yes, for the most part. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't, I definitely, they're, they're, yes, they're far more bioavailable. I don't, I don't want to like vilify the animal, uh, the, the vegetable proteins. I think I've, I've probably done that before in my past and I don't want to put anything in this like super bad category. I think any food can be in a healthy diet, to be honest with you. I just think it shouldn't be the majority of your diet and it shouldn't be the most of your protein. And if I think if you have animal proteins more available to you, that should always be the optimal choice. But if you had some vegetarian proteins, is it going to kill you? I don't want people to be afraid of food. I think it's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, yes, animal proteins is certainly a, a, a higher uh, level of protein. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to kind of go through the macros. Uh, yeah. I, I did this with my buddy Doug yesterday and, and it's, it's the same thing. We, we both agree with this. Where do you get your protein? Okay. Animal foods. Where do you get your fat? animal sources, right? We don't want plant fats. We already went through that. PUFAs, if, in case people don't understand, that's the polyunsaturated fats. That's, those are higher in the plant foods. We want the saturated fats. Mono is fine. So where do you get your fat? Animal sources. Where do you get your nutrients? A lot of animal sources. You get egg yolks, raw milk, oysters, seafood, uh, organ sure. meats, like all these. This is lots of vitamins and minerals. Yeah, you can get some st stuff from plants, but I just don't think there's a lot of our nutrients coming from plants. And then where do we get our energy? We can get our carbs from plants. You know, it, it, it seems like it's a pretty elegant solution that just it's like, how does the human body work? And uh, yeah, get your get your clean carb sources from plants. Get your fruit. You can have dairy. You can have honey. You can have, you know, some tubers and roots. And it seems it seems like a perfect world to me. And it is just the ultimate ancestral diet. The, the only question that we I, I want to save for later is, yeah, is this ancestrally possible or appropriate? Or, you know, did we always have this abundance of, of great carb sources available year round? But we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that because okay. it's okay. a bit of a thought experiment. But, it, it, but still, so just to get, to get your diet, the ideal ways of getting all of your essential amino acids and fatty acids and protein, mineral, vitamins, it, do you think that's a decent framework? I think that's a, yes, as a, a generalized like idea of what foods are most beneficial. Yes, I would totally agree with that. Um, and, but again, it, it always depends on the individual and what they can manage and how they can utilize the energy and so forth. So everyone is going to be different because then you're going to get people that do that. And all of a sudden they're like, well, I can't tolerate milk. And when I eat these foods, it messes up with my GI system. Right. Or if I eat this food, I feel super tired or whatever their individual problem is. And so you might have to address them a little bit differently and say, or, you know, if you're, if they're coming in and they already have like some level of insulin resistance and they can't utilize sugars properly, it, or if they're diabetic or if they have cancer or whatever is going on with them, I would always utilize that as my framework and then figure out what they can manage where they're at right now in their life, right? And the, and the thing is, if somebody is healthy, I think that they can utilize a different level of macronutrients. Um, I would you know, say, okay, maybe you need 120 grams of protein, but as far as how much carbs to fat you have, it can change, right? Maybe it's, it can just vary for them. And, and mine varies, right? Am I like 50% carb? <laughs> 25 fat, 25 protein every single day? Absolutely not. It, it does vary. And I think when you're healthy, it can, and that can be totally fine. I, tr I try to get the same amount of protein in daily, but the carb fat ratio might change depending on just what I'm eating. However, if someone has specific situations, then we do focus in on that because I definitely know some people can't manage like 20, 30, 40% fat. It's too much for them if we're trying to increase their body's ability to use glucose. So we have to lower it a little bit lower or a lot lower depending on what they can deal with. And so, but sometimes somebody just increasing their, their nutrients will improve a lot of those metabolic markers just because they, you know, everyone today I feel like is just undernourished. 
because they've been eating shitty food for so long or been told to eat vegan or all this processed crap out there. And so they're not even getting the bioavailable nutrients that they need. So that is like a missing function in so many people's diet. And so sometimes just improving that can, can, can fix stuff. Um, sometimes again, it, it might need to go a step farther. So my philosophy is always to like do the minimum to get the max result, right? If we can do this and things are better, cool. Let's just do that. If we do that and, and it doesn't get better, then we need to do another step or another step or another step. And for a lot of people though, you have to look at their entire life because if they are going at a hundred miles an hour and they're in a really unhealthy space, you can only get so far with them with just diet alone. I mean, you're mm-hmm. like, look, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta slow down <laughs> or we're, we're not going to get much farther than like, oh. you know, not indefinitely, but while you're in that healing space, we need to slow things down so we can allow your body to heal. If not, we're just spinning energy constantly. We just can't utilize it to heal you. Oh, absolutely. That's where the sleep and the stress management, all that other stuff comes in. But okay. So you're, oh. Before, when you're talking about metabolic dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, you're saying people who are eating a lot of calories, but not a lot of nutrients, right? And that's when the problems go awry. That's basically the standard American diet. And that's just a processed food diet, right? It's like you almost define a bad diet as a lot of calories without a lot of nutrients, right? That's just basically describing processed foods. And so we're definitely on the same page there. I want to throw that out. And I want to throw out the food pyramid. So some people are hearing you, they're like, oh, is this is this person just talking about, it sounds like she's just going back to the food pyramid or you mentioned low fat. And I just wanted you to differentiate what you mean. It's not, you're not saying go get low fat products and, you know, eat the food pyramid. No. And I'm only saying that for someone that has a specific issue. And, and I would only say that to somebody that, that didn't respond well to maybe other changes. And that's more of somebody that has a real problem utilizing sugar's energy. And I, you know, so, and I can only give you like some anecdotal stories from people that I've worked with that maybe have come off like carnivore or keto where adding carbohydrates, they don't get a really good response, right? I mean, they immediately are getting high blood sugar levels because their body just can't utilize that energy. So over time, although you will get higher blood sugars response um, initially, for them to actually start responding properly, we have we get the we get the fat quite low, and then their body starts being able to utilize the glucose without all of these spikes and and blood sugar dysregulation. But that is these are for like specific people. But normally, I would say yeah, fat should be probably around twenty to forty twenty to thirty percent for most people. And I when I say that, I'm saying mostly animal fats. Um, yes, not your seeds, not your your plant oils, not all of, you know, all of these other oils that are being pushed um, by the food manufacturers. So the, the food pyramid, in my opinion, looks quite different. It's probably more like fruits and roots at the bottom <laughs> versus grains um, and, 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 and breads and all those things at the bottom, which I think that's kind of what the recommendation is, um, minimizing those kind of things. But again, not opposed to them completely, but Again, for people to utilize energy best, I think they actually work better with things like fruits and honeys and, sh- and milk sugar. And then, yes, some tubers um, can be helpful. Yeah, I just want to make that clear because we're on the same page. There's like the the camp we're in. I, I, well, I say camp, no camp, but I still we're in this realm over here that's like very, very, very different from the food pyramid, I think. And it may be we may differ in or I don't even say we, cause I, I'm not necessarily in, you know, this certain world of high fat. Maybe I was yeah. a few years ago, but we're, we're kind of doing a different thing than what it, but most other 95% of the world is talking about. Right. Do you describe it as that? Like we're, we're talking about a very specific group of foods that are almost all whole foods and they are not, I mean, maybe you can describe it. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but no, I would say they are all whole foods for sure. They're nutrient, high nutrient density foods. And they, because they're not super hard to break down, right? So we also look at foods that are low in anti-nutrients. Um, and maybe some of these should be cooked because obviously those will also help your body utilize them. But we want food to come into you to make it available so that you can utilize it. And, and I should probably say that 
from my approach too, I like to give people easy to digest foods. I don't, that's why I don't want to give them a lot of raw salads or nuts and seeds because it takes your body a lot of energy to break those foods down and get what it needs out of them. And so if your body is compromised and we know that digestion is probably one of the first things that becomes compromised in somebody that might be sick, right? 95% of the people I work with have horrible GI function. Um, and that is going to happen in a very low metabolic stress state, right? Uh, b- uh, blood is going to leave the GI system. So things are not going to j- digest properly when you're under stress. And we can always think about that if we're in fight or flight, running from a bear, the last thing your body cares about is digestion at that point. Also hormone function. They both go to shit under stress. And so if we can ass- assess that, and then we know that, look, your digestive system is the entry wave of all your nutrients and energy. And if it is compromised, then that's probably a good place for us to start working. Because we want to get optimal energy and and nutrients into your system. And so one way to do that is to give you foods that don't take a lot of work for you to break down. Because if digestion is working at 50%, we don't want to make it work super, super hard or utilize all your energy to have to break down this food. And so having fruits, fruits are really a lot easier for you to digest than the starches or the grains. And they're filled with a decent amount of nutrients. Same thing with the bioavailable uh, animal proteins over the vegetable proteins. Vegetable proteins, much harder for your system to break down. Bioavailable protein is much less. So we, those are the, the basis of why we recommend certain things. As someone's digestion improves and their body's ability to utilize energy improves, you can add other foods in there with very little effect. Now, they might still have it. If you could say, oh, now I want to like eat beans every day. Well, yeah, you might after some time have some problems. Or normally what I find is they're just like, yeah, it just doesn't feel well to me. And so it's saying you can have it, maybe you have it here and there, but it might not be something that you choose to do as your health improve. And it always is a choice in my opinion. I don't ever like to force anyone saying you cannot do any of these things or say they are particularly bad at all. It's like when you get to a place it's usually much easier for you to make that decision because you see, you're aware, when I eat this food, I don't feel very good. So I'm not going to eat this food anymore. This is awesome. I love all this. And I think people listening are, are realizing that we're pretty much on the same page here. But it's funny because it's you're saying kind of the opposite of the mainstream diet advice. There's still so many people out there, even who do believe in the health of meat and red meat and animal foods, there's still getting this advice that you need to eat salads and raw kale and smoothies with all of these blended things and almond milks and nuts and seeds. And these are the healthiest foods. And everyone knows these are the healthiest foods. And you're kind of saying, these are the hardest to digest foods. They have the most anti-nutrients. Maybe they're not great. Maybe like you said, you can add them back in, which I appreciate too, right? Like I I can still handle anything really. Cause I just want, it's like, oh, once a month. Yeah. I had some nuts and like seeds and some kind of dessert someone made great yeah but yeah I don't but just, want... it's just interesting it's the opposite of the it, still people are caught in this old health paradigm that it revolves around kale and nuts and seeds and beans and and you know maybe because there's some sort of meta analysis out there that shows that these people that are eating these foods are have better health markers or something. Right. And, but maybe they're comparing them, you know, to somebody that eats McDonald's right (laughs) every day. And so if somebody goes from eating McDonald's every day to eating like salads and nuts and seeds and almond milk, you're probably going to have some health improvements. And so if we compare those two things, okay, yep. Yeah. This is better. This is a better diet. Um, and we always have to understand the context of it and try and where are they trying to achieve, right? And maybe in that study, the only marker, one of the main markers is where we're just trying to see if they lose weight or maybe they just feel better. But again, if you're eating McDonald's all day long, then yeah, you're going to feel better on that approach. Or their LDL. Maybe they're just looking at their LDL yeah. and like, oh, their LDL improved. Great. Right. And we've gotten, they've gotten stuck into like, we, they look at these cholesterol markers and say, well, that improved that. So that must be better for you. And none of that is necessarily true (laughs) because yes, we know that all the PUFAs actually will improve cholesterol markers, but doesn't necessarily mean again, that just because something lowers your cholesterol doesn't mean it's good for you. Just because some things improve markers doesn't mean it's good for you. We have to understand the mechanism of what it might be doing to you to give you that result. 
And if we're just taking something, right, so that it lowers a symptom or improves a marker without understanding why is that even occurring, then we're missing the entire reason your body's giving you that symptom. And that seems to occur a lot in the medical approach is they don't address, well, why is this? Why is your cholesterol elevating? What else could be happening in your body that maybe will produce this result? Instead, they're like, well, let's give you this drug and then we'll lower it. And there you go. You're good. You're fine. I mean, and to me, that's just never going to fix the system because then they're going to think everything's fine. They have now lower cholesterol and they're going to continue to do all the crappy things they've been doing until all of a sudden they have another symptom that's going to, and then they'll be getting another drug. And so what is, I don't know what the average American is on, like six, mm -hmm. seven <laughs> drugs. Yeah. I mean, we, we definitely love our drugs here. We certainly the the higher usage drug country in the world. So with yeah, the poorest yeah, yeah. outcomes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We have the highest level of obesity, some of the worst health outcomes, health outcomes, certainly in industrialized countries, yet we consume and are taking more drugs than anybody else. I don't, I think it's something like 60% of the world's drugs are utilized in the United States. It's, it's quite high. It's a nightmare. And then the, the newest study says there's only 7% who are metabolically healthy. Uh, but it, yeah, the, these quote, good cholesterol numbers are, are up for debate as well. What do you, you know, I think we're kind of on the same page on the cholesterol. Maybe you could just give the audience kind of a recap on what you believe for, you know, would be good for HDL triglycerides and if LDL matters is, or maybe it does matter if in the right context, right? Cause I maybe something it, else is going wrong. I think it, they all can matter to some level of context, but I mean, I always like to ask the question, if you have elevated cholesterol, what what, why? Where is it coming from? I mean, can diet affect it? Can. Um, I think dietary cholesterol affects it quite little, maybe 20, 25%. But I still, I think a diet, a, someone's diet can certainly af affect their cholesterol. I think the biggest driver of cholesterol is stress and inflammation and low thyroid function um, because we do need thyroid hormone to convert cholesterol into our steroidal hormones. So if we have suppressed thyroid function, we're not going to have that occur. And so you will see it in people that are very, uh, hypothyroid, hypometabolic, they're going to have elevated cholesterol numbers. So if you can actually improve their response to stress, improve energy production, actually give them enough usable energy, you'll see those numbers start to drop. Some people can just take thyroid hormone, not telling anyone to do that, but there's certainly you can show that somebody who needs it and they take it, their cholesterol numbers will drop. So I think it's always there for a reason. It's that it's telling us something. Um, it's not saying just ignore everything, but I think there's plenty of studies that show that you can have elevated cholesterol numbers and be totally healthy. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a nuanced topic we don't need to get into, but yeah, if people everyone I've seen that r like lowers processed foods and lowers seed oils and stuff like that, refined foods, they have great cholesterol results as in higher HDL, lower triglycerides, and then the LDL is kind of the curveball. So I, I actually think that very more often than not improves in all of those, but some people might go, you know, their LDL might be a little hay haywire. And then that's like sort of the, the question mark of what else is going on or yeah. if LDL matters as much. Yeah. I mean, you have, I mean, a processed food, food diet is a, a very stressful diet. I mean, it's just low nutrient, high calorie, high PUFA, just tons of just hard to digest foods in there. I mean, the, 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 the that whole diet, there's nothing good is going to become of it. So yeah, eating just whole real foods is going to give you a better outcome for sure. And again, it's just less stress on the system and that's going to improve cholesterol numbers. Okay, so we got into some of the gut and digestion talk. That's super important to you and me and probably most people. So how yeah, like how how can you help that? What foods? I mean, we kind of discussed some of the foods, what foods are better than the ones we said to avoid already and how much of that yeah, what do do you think uh, affects someone's health and how how do you fix that? So like I said, probably 95% of the people that I work with have some sort of GI dysfunction. Um, and it's to me, again, it's going to come when the stress on the system, there's more demands than you have energy available. So you can decrease the, the, the energy demands and that sometimes can improve someone's digestion or improve their body's ability to utilize fuel and 
so that they can have more energy to have their digestive system work better, right? We know that we digest best in that parasympathetic state. It's like rest and digest, right? If you're chronically stressed all the time, then you're going to have a hard time digesting. So we support it, right? Again, easy to digest foods. We don't want the digestive system to have to work really hard to get the energy it needs. Sometimes that can be utilized, utilizing fruit juices. Um, it can be utilizing, I, I use a lot of cooked fruit with people or tropical fruits, ones that they can digest fairly easily. I like to remove skins from things. Uh, I try to, I sometimes stay away from the starchy fruits initially, like bananas, because again, it's a little bit harder for them to break down or I just have them cook everything. Just cook all your fruits. That's going to make it easier on your system. Um, if they have extreme GI issues, I usually keep them away from starch initially. Or I might use some that are like really well cooked, soaked but white potatoes, um, balanced with some fruit to help get them regulated. I usually have them eat small meals so we don't burden the system too much at one time. There might be other nutrients that we would look at. Certainly the B vitamins, B1, um, uh, make sure that they're getting enough copper and zinc and magnesium to help support the energy system. Because again, it all, it all kind of circles with each other, right? You got to get the food digested and absorbed, and then you have to get the cells to produce energy to give the system energy to do what it needs to be doing. So certainly taking some of the burden off of their life. Um, if somebody's like, I'm a long distance runner and I have tons of GI issues, which I mean, I don't know how many people you've talked to that are distance runners. They all have GI issues, right? So <laughs> And sometimes that's a lot of times where they don't do well on carbohydrates. They just can't digest anything because they're just on in this chronically stressed state all the time. So you've seen data on these endurance runners that get on these high fat diets and can do better because of their, I think their GI just can't manage any of the carbohydrates. But yeah, we might have to take some of that burden. Maybe we need to rest and not do those kind of exercises for a period of time. I don't want to tell anybody they can't do something if they love it, but Endurance running is certainly not beneficial for being supportive to a high metabolic rate. Um, it just will suppress you all the time. And so, you know, to get GI function working properly, yeah, we need to involve maybe less rest yoga, trying to get your sleep under control, and then supporting you energetically the best way. And also the other thing is, yeah, removing all these hard to digest foods that might be compromised. So the plant proteins, the nuts and the seeds, a lot of the raw vegetables, um, I either remove them entirely or minimize them and, you know, and see how that person does. I love it. That's great. And I love that. Like, no, I don't like the chronic cardio. I'm into sprinting, <laughs> walking, weights yes. and sports. Yes. That's yeah. what I'm into. I think <laughs> and you can do a little yoga in there. Yeah. Do things you love and you enjoy if you, and getting outside, getting in nature, get your brain stimulated, get, you know, get off the treadmill. Um, go outside and whatever that is that you love, as long as your body can sustain it. My, my big thing is if you can go work out and do what you like and, and, and support it nutritionally and you sleep well, cool. I'm okay with all that. Right. But if you go to your exercise and then your sleep goes to shit, when you go exercise, well, then we know that that is a variable that we need to adjust. We either need to eat more or we need to just take some of that load off you right now until we can fix things and that you can be able to be better adapted to be able to manage that. I mean, to me, it's always, we, ha we have to work in steps because as someone gets better, you know, they always want to add things on immediately, right? They feel a little better. I mean, it's so quick. Like people say, oh, I feel better. Let me tag on 10 things to my day because I'm doing better. <laughs> and I get that, especially if you've been sick for a long period of time, you're like, finally, um, we just have to be very careful and we just have to continue to keep raising and, and getting their body to utilize fuel better so that they can manage their life. Because we want people to have stressors in their life. Exercise is a stressor. We want you to be able to enjoy your life and have all these things occur and live to the fullest potential that you possibly can. Um, but we might have to kind of tame you down a little bit until we're able to build you up so that you can manage all that a lot better. Yeah. So back, you were talking about tropical fruits and fruit juices. And some people might be clutching their pearls, to use an antiquated <laughs> reference. Uh, what about blood sugar? You know, it sounds like that would be kind of, a, especially if you're talking about eating often, it would be a a roller coaster of blood sugar. Uh, but it's not a roller coaster. Now, again, I'm not saying go drink two quarts of orange juice at one time. Although some people can absolutely manage that. 
but it depends on that individual. Again, if someone has poor blood sugar control, I probably wouldn't give them a lot of juices, maybe more solids. And, and it's always balanced with some carbs and protein so that it's not entering your blood system all at once. Yeah. Um, and depend, right? Depends on the, the individual, right? So if, again, if they need less fat, then we might utilize a little bit more protein to help regulate how quick the sugar gets into their system. But I've seen people that have some level of insulin resistance and consume fruit juice, high potassium food also has fructose in it. So it doesn't, again, give you those massive spikes, right? You are going to get some level of increase when you consume sugar. Absolutely. That's normal. Having insulin raise is normal. All of those things occur. That's totally normal. It's when you see it excessively high and stays high for long periods of time. That's where there's problems. But I've certainly seen people with insulin resistant consume 100% fruit juice and then check their blood sugar and in two hours be totally fine. And they're like, well, how did that happen, right? The sugar is supposed to be creating all my problems. But if we, we gave them a bunch of sugar and fat, then in two hours, that we would see much, much higher blood sugars from them that might, because their body was unable to utilize that sugar properly or quick enough because there was just too much fat in their blood. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so some people would say, well, that's how the, the blood sugar problems develop. Like, what if you did this chronically? I mean, I think that's some people's idea of how insulin resistance comes to be is chronic, you know, sugar. Chronically high. Yeah. But what is what is, the, the, one of the, the, the hormones you have to talk about when you talk about blood sugar or one of the many, it's not just insulin as a regulator right? There's cortisol, there's adrenaline, there's thyroid, there's glucagon. Potassium has a, an effect on your blood sugar. There's a lot of other things that are going to affect your blood sugar than just sugar in itself. And right, we know that we see people that are stressed. I have people that are like, I barely have carbohydrates and I have high fasting blood sugar. They're like eating like 20, 30 grams, they wake up high fasting blood sugar. How is that possible? Right? <laughs> They're not eating any carbs, right? Their body is essentially going into a stress response at night. And it's oh, trying man. to keep their blood sugar up because there isn't any coming in. So I get these high fasting blood glucose levels and we start giving them enough carbohydrates through the day and getting their liver capable of storing more glycogen that all of a sudden consuming way more carbohydrates brings down those fasting glucose numbers. So if, if it's more carbohydrates is creating the problem, I would think that would have the opposite effect, but it doesn't. It has a beneficial effect because now we're giving it to them as they go, they're help regulating it. They're bringing down their stress response. We have to always consider the effects of cortisol because it's going to have an increase in blood sugar levels. And so it's not just insulin that we have to worry about. We need to worry about all these stress mediators that we have to address as well. And when we do, and again, it's not saying go out and eat, you know, six loaves of bread with, and put a bunch of butter on it. Now I got some carbs. <laughs> And that's going to be the thing, right? Especially in someone that isn't regulating, right? All that starch and fat is going to keep your blood sugar nice and high for hours and hours and hours because you're just not going to be able to utilize it. But utilizing fruits, because potassium, again, can help facilitate sugar getting into the, the, the cell. Fructose is helpful also to help get uh, to utilize sugar and to help regulate blood sugar. It's not going to have that effect as like glucose will. And then there, your body's just able to utilize it with all these other minerals in there. So it can help for someone to have some protein with it to kind of just slow the absorption depending on what they need. But for someone that does have blood sugar issues, you would give them small meals throughout the day to help keep them regulated until their liver learns to be able to uh, hold more uh, sugar better, to hold glycogen better so it can kind of keep them uh, asleep through the night. Because we all know if we're waking up in the middle of the night, your body's unable to regulate. And so blood sugar is falling at some point in time and adrenaline's waking you up. So sometimes it's teaching your liver to able to store uh, sugar better. And that comes with slow, incrementally adding it through the day, trying not to overconsume it, balancing it with uh, fats, protein to keep yourself regulated. Yeah, uh, no, I do agree with that because I, I did have some problems with sleep. And my my body temperature was a bit low, so I never did do uh, like keto or carnivore or anything for, like consistently for long periods because I never thought that that was a good idea. 
And mm-hmm. I, yeah, I have seen people do that. They get the high fasting blood sugar when they wake up, when they, if they go keto or carnivore for too long, it's the body's yeah. just like, well, what's going on here? But, uh, no, I, I think it's good to very thoughtfully. Yeah. They kind of add back in good sources of carbs just for many reasons, even if it's just enjoyment, <laughs> but, uh, just to have your body be able to get some glucose and not kind of bonk at night. That's how someone described it to me a few years ago. You're waking up. It's like, you're almost like bonking your liver is like bonking. Like it ran out of glycogen. Yeah. And it, and it, it, it is right. And that's why but like your, your body's tightly regulated with blood sugar. If it goes too low, you die. And so since your body's number one uh, job is to keep you alive. It just like, I got to keep this person alive. So I'm going to have all these adaptation processes over here to turn on if we don't have optimal fuel available or we don't have enough stored. So I have all these secondary resource or these adaptation features to, to keep you alive, which is awesome. Like cortisol is not bad. It keeps you alive. Adrenaline is not bad. It keeps you alive. It's just when we flip into living in that cycle all the time is where we start having problems. And so we have to pull ourselves back into what does it look like optimally for human function to perform the best, to sleep the best, you know, want to have sex, um, to be able to feel its best. What does that look like? And, you know, if we look at youth and we can see that, you know, children are very good glucose consumers and, and glucose metabolizers and they, right, heal faster, sleep 12 hours. I mean, you know, that's what is optimal for them. And as we age, we become really poor. That ability to utilize glucose actually decreases and we actually become more fat metabolizers as we age. Is that a good adaptation? Well, we're aging and things are not working as well and things are degenerating. So I'm not sure that that is. I don't think I don't see why you'd want to push yourself into that space earlier on in your life. Again, it might lower lo- certain metabolic markers temporarily, but I don't see it as a good avenue long term. And I and I see it in the people that are doing it in their twenties and thirties, especially women. Um, going super low carbohydrate is not a good place for you, and especially as you start aging, you're going to start having problems. But again, if you've lived in that stress response for long periods of time, your body will not respond to carbohydrates very well initially. So you have to kind of understand what it's going to take to get yourself in a better space. And what does that look like? And again, it might start with, hey, getting some animal proteins in, getting good quality carbohydrates in, eating regularly through the day, and making sure you have enough nutrients and minerals. Like That's a great place to start. And that will fix a lot of people. But then it might be some other nuances in there that you might have to address because maybe you have a lot of GI issues. Maybe you have a lot of hormonal issues at this point. Maybe there's just an abundance of stress on your life that has to be addressed. So we have to kind of address each individual individual individually without trying to make this seem too complex. Because it, quite honestly, if you have that foundation, like you said, animal proteins, quality fruits, that's a good place to start and then eat them balanced throughout the day, right? Like that is very helpful as a good place. Okay. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. And we're both, both huge fans of nutrient density. And then some people will hear that you mentioned early in this episode that glucose metabolism requires more nutrients. So what's the deal? You know, what gives? Yeah. Well, that's, so just saying, that's, so- yeah. Well, yeah. if you're, you, you know, if you have a high powered engine, right, if you have a Ferrari, it's going to utilize probably more oil than your Ford Fiesta because it's just a high powered engine and you want to be a Ferrari, not a Ford Fiesta. So when we start going at a high rate and utilizing energy at a high rate, because now we're having good hormonal function, right? What I see is as imp- people and women particularly improve metabolic rate, right? All their period issues go away and they actually want to have sex. Infertility issues go away. All of these things that we've been told are just like happening because now we have clinics and billion dollar industries set up to fix it. We're not actually addressing why are these people having these experiences? They're just not utilizing energy or able to reduce it properly, especially women, right? Women are coming into their, ten- their 20s and 30s under eating, over exercising, trying to do it all. They are completely, and they're eating all these vegan vegetarian foods. They're just becoming completely depleted and wondering why they have all these hormonal issues and all have to be put on birth control to control them. We don't, right? We just need to support your energetic demands better nutritionally, energetically, and so forth. 
And so in that high state, high engine state, you're going to utilize all resources at a higher amount. That's not a bad thing. It just means they need to go together. Well, yeah. So the solution is just to eat a super nutrient dense diet, as we were saying. Yeah. Super that's easy to digest in the right amounts, macronutrient right and frequencies for you. That's it. That's like sums it up right there. So then, yeah. So what would a nutrient dense diet? So it's like including organs, including egg yolks or eggs, including oysters, including fruits for certain nutrients. Yeah. I, I mean, certainly. I literally will tell you that oysters and, and organ liver are like, you know, must haves because of their such high bioavailable nutrients in there. I mean, like there, I, I love liver and liver more often, the more I dive into it and how I've literally seen it improve so many people's lives by finally adding it in. Like we can improve so many more and then like, we just need, because a lot of people resist it. It's not the tastiest food on the planet. <laughs> We've all tried to fix it a hundred different ways. But if you can get past that and just see it as like, this is like the best supplement I could possibly take and get it in frequently, I've seen it fix anemia and energy issues, improve a diet, someone that has diabetes. I mean, as soon as they get it in regularly, it can improve so many things because of so many bioavailable nutrients that it has. And, you know, same thing with like oysters and of course other organ meats are good. Um, red meat can be quite good for most people, not everybody. I certainly don't tell everyone to consume that because some don't utilize it properly, um, but can be a very good source of nutrition and protein. Um, and then, yeah, mostly fruits and juices and honey and tubers are the basis of where you're and and milk um, are kind of be where you're going to get some carbohydrates. Of course, milk is also some fat and protein. Um, and depending on the milk source, that's like a whole nother conversation because yeah, some people prefer raw cow's milk. Some people can't do raw cow milk or it's not available to them. Some people prefer goat. Some people, depending on their, their different goals, we, we will utilize a low fat milk. So it, it will depend on the individual kind of where we go with dairy, but it is still a very good source of nutrition. And as long as your body can tolerate it, it ha it's not, doesn't take a lot of energy to break that food down to get all those nutrients from it. Absolutely. I'm getting more and more into raw milk. I was always into raw milk and raw cheese and getting like super good quality. I just didn't eat it much, but now kind of, I'm kind of on, on board and I'm waiting for my new batch of raw milk soon. But uh, also, I do have to plug my company knows the tail because we put the organs in the, the ground beef. So we make it easy. It is hard to eat. So I end up eating my own primal ground beef product a lot because it has kidney, heart, liver and spleen in the ground beef. 25% of it is organ meat. And that's you don't awesome. really taste it. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. the way you people some people you can like swallow it raw. Uh, you know, there's all these different ways, but I think it's, it's super important to just get it in weekly. And uh, we also even make a liver vores this right behind me uh, in a stick. This is like the first time I even talk about my products on my podcast. I'm always just <laughs> like shameful. I don't want to be a salesman uh, and I don't want to like pitch products, but I mean, this is why I make them is because, well, I want to eat them and I want other people to be able to eat liver and have it be easy and taste good. So I do yeah, have. Well, them. I think anybody that can do that, you should probably let people know because it is challenging for a lot of people, and it is such a good food. And those are just some of the foods I would say when when you look at this approach. Yeah, everybody eventually needs to get there. A lot of people are like, I can't do that yet, or you know, they have so many other things that they can work on. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we don't have to worry about that yet because we have a hundred other things over here that we can work on to improve you. And if you have like a, a big energy expenditure, if you're consuming 3000 plus calories and we can get a lot of the nutrients elsewhere, then sometimes we don't need it. But a lot of people can't, they're not consuming that much. And so if you're consuming, I think under 2000 calories, you kind of need it for the additional nutrients. So certainly my experience. That's a good point. Yeah. Like some athletes can get away with things. That's why I think the only people that I've seen that are relatively okay on vegan diets are these endurance athletes eating like 4,000, 5,000 calories a day. And it's, it's like brute force. They might be getting enough nutrients kind of to like stave them off. <laughs> but, uh, 
yeah, come on down to nosetail.org. Get your <laughs> get your products. I got them all. Uh, okay, awesome. So let's wrap up a few more things. Uh, we've hit a lot. Man, we could go on forever, I'm sure. That I love all this stuff, and I've been getting into it over the past year and a half. But I guess my one problem is the ancestral side and the fact that it really pins everything just on, say, PUFAs and stress. You know what I mean? It seems like so many bad things come from these highly like sugary and carby foods. And now you're kind of saying they're off the hook. And I know you're not saying that, but it's like, is there that big a difference between, say, a piece of bread and a potato? And some people would say no. And some people, you might say yes. Right. You, you kind of know what I'm getting at. It's like if we're saying that sugar is fine, glucose is fine, carbs are fine. And then you're, you're like, so, so what's the problem? Why are we all fat and sick? Well, again, context. Right. I mean, if you overconsume anything, you can have adverse reactions. Right. I mean, if you eat 10 pounds of meat, you can have an adverse reaction. So you have to. You said dog. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so, and again, if it's a processed carbohydrate versus a fruit, it's going to be a big difference. So we have to understand what, where we're going with this, right? It's hard to overconsume just tons of fruit. Can it be done? Most definitely. And especially depending on the health of the person. Ultimately, we can start back with context is important because too much of anything is going to create problems. And obviously, when people think of sugar, they're thinking, oh, sugar's good. But then they go eat a cookie, a cake, and that's just not sugar anyways. That's usually combined with some flours and polyunsaturated fats or so forth. Uh, so it's kind of hard just to eat overconsume fruit and, and have adverse reactions. But, you know, certainly it could if you overconsume what your body was able to utilize, right? Anytime we eat too much energy than we can burn, we're going to gain body fat. Um, much harder with carbohydrates because we basically will store them as glycogen first versus fat. Um, but I think you have to like say, you know, this doesn't mean that go ahead and consume copious amounts of sugar, even though I'm not worried about just white sugar. I mean, other than wearing a right, sugar shirt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, again, I don't, I don't think that sugar is a bad food. I think again, it is void of calories, but it's a decent energy. If you needed energy, you could utilize white sugar. Void of nutrients. Yes. Void of nutrients. void of calories. Yeah. I'm sorry. Void of nutrients. Yeah. It's not void of calories. Um, definitely void of nutrients, but is a high energy food, meaning you can utilize it if you need energy and it's an easy to digest food. So if we're coming from an energy perspective, it can be utilized and we can use it as fuel. Um, but yeah, do you want to do that a lot? No, especially in somebody that has a, isn't eating enough nutrition, because again, you're going to start creating nutritional deficiencies. So there has to be a level of balance. And I think everybody wants to just say this food is good and bad and I can have this and whatever I want. And that's never what we're saying here. Um, you have to always take into what are you currently consuming energetically? You're consuming 1200 calories. Maybe you need 2000 to fix yourself. But if you go from 1200 to 2000, you're going to have some problems and you're going to gain some fat and you might have some poor health markers from that. Right. But maybe that's what you eventually need. But to get there, you can't just go from A to Z. You need to go slow and steady when you transition and start adding more calories in. Um, I certainly recommend everybody utilize food logging or chronometer, especially initially, to help them see where they're at so they can see, well, how, where am I getting my calories? Where are they coming from? What kind of nutrition am I getting? How much overall energy am I consuming every day? And then change that a little bit and add the foods in that are more bioavailable, more energy, better protein sources, and then slowly, steadily increase your calories based on, is my sleep improving? Is my energy improving? Is my temperature and pulse improving? You know, it, is my period feel better? All of these things are kind of the markers that we look at to see if your overall health is improving. We don't need to take copious amounts of labs. We can utilize these very easy markers to assess if we're doing better. And so that's normally what, like the progress I would take someone. But it, yes, don't listen to this and think, I, that Kate said I could go eat a quart of ice cream all the time. I did not say that. <laughs> 
I'm not afraid of that food, but it needs to be utilized in the context of what's good for you and taking into consideration your total calorie expenditure and making sure that we're not overdoing it. Because again, people do this approach and, and see, oh, now I can have milk and fruits and all of these things and they just overboard. And next thing you know, they're 10, 20 pounds heavier. Well, it's, I'm not, I do think there is that healing process and you need to kind of fix your metabolism and then everyone should be able to eat a couple thousand calories a day, even if you're a smaller person. So yes, absolutely. And, and I do understand that may require gaining some weight initially, but do you think, I, I'm not a big fan of food logging. I think it's a it's super important learning tool. And I have my own reasons for thinking it's bad. So I'm not saying it's bad for people to do because they need to learn. And mm-hmm. a lot of people just have no idea. And I guess I should say just because I've you know, been into this stuff for like eight years that I don't need to do that doesn't mean that everyone knows the same stuff I know because I kind of can just do it in my head a little bit, right? Well, no, actually, well, I, I don't count calories at all in my head. But which leads me to my question is, do you think people after they learn and after they go through their healing stage, they can naturally regulate their satiety and not overeat using these foods. Absolutely. And I think because everybody, I think some people come into this approach or some people talk about eating intuitively, right? And I'm, I'm totally okay with eating intuitively, but ultimately you have to eat very intentionally initially, right? Your diet has to be like, okay, what am I, what kind of response am I supposed to be getting? What does that look like? Right. And so sometimes food logging helps people see, oh, I need more food. Right. So it's basically in the beginning, right? So let's just say somebody is not able to utilize energy and they, and they are uh, high cortisol, high stress in the morning, have no appetite. If they're intuitive, they're going to be like, I'm not going to eat. My body's telling me I don't want anything. Where intentionally, you're like, look, you need to break your fast. We need to start giving your body and teaching it to utilize energy better. So we're going to start incorporating a small meal in the beginning of your day to start getting your body capable and able to start using energy more in the earlier parts of the day. So there's an intentional part. And I think that food logging helps people see that. They're like, oh, I can see now why yesterday when I did this thing or I did my exercise or I skipped this meal. And I had this drag down later in the later in the day, or I didn't sleep as well, or whatever it is, right? It just gives them data and an understanding of why they might be experiencing certain things, right? And so, especially in the beginning, people don't know. Right? I know I, I don't have energy, or yesterday, I and mean, even when they're logging, they'll be like, two days ago I didn't sleep well, and they can't see it yet. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, what else happened that day? Like, oh, well. I went and did two exercises, you know, two workouts. I did this. And I'm like, yeah, you ate the exact same amount of calories as you would when you don't work out. So it makes sense why you wouldn't have good sleep. And they're like, oh, so it just gives them a concept that they're needing to meet their energy demands to have all of these things work for them. And so I think that's the value of food logging. Um, I don't do it anymore. I haven't, you know, but I will do it. If something starts occurring and I'm like, huh, what is going on with me? And then I'll log and I'm like, oh, you're just not eating enough. Cause I'll get busy like everybody else. We get in these things and then I will not eat enough. <laughs> so, and so for me, sometimes I can see things better when I have it in front of me so I can tweak it. And then again, it just kind of gives me some data and some feedback so I can see, oh, that's maybe what's happening here. Mm. But what about overeating though? Like, do you think this is naturally satiating that? That was kind of one of my my main questions. Meaning, do so I feel... They give someone three months, say someone six months. Six months down the line, they learned everything, they're good. If they're eating multiple meals with the you know juice and honey, can they? do you think they can naturally regulate their appetite? Because it Absolutely. just seems a little bit far-fetched. I mean... I, yeah. And again, we're not just consuming car- tons of carbohydrates by themselves that might dysregulate someone's blood sugar. We're always giving them carbs and fat to help slow the absorption of that carbohydrate into their system. And their day to day is going to change. So from a healing perspective, what I normally find, especially if somebody's in a stress state, they half the time have no appetite. So I'm going to like work to increase that appetite. If they're coming to me with a ravenous appetite, then usually it's basically balancing their food better. They're eating too much of one thing at one time. 
and their body's just not, blood sugar is all over the place. And but it's not because they're under eating or they're in that because a lot of times when we get in a stress state, we appetite goes. So for a lot of those people, we have to kind of relearn to pull appetite. We want you to mm. wake up with appetite. We want you Ep to be able to want to eat. Ab so yes, in time, yes, I it absolutely can regulate them. In time, okay, because but it seems like ninety three percent of America, if I'm just using that as a proxy, are overeating. I don't know what, yeah, whatever, 60% are obese or overweight. There's all these different statistics. I think most people's problem is that they're always hungry. I, I've rarely, rarely ever heard someone who doesn't eat enough. So we might be seeing different people. Well, and it could be they're, they're not hungry in the morning and they get hungry later on. So what's happening, they're waking up slightly stressed. They don't have that big of an appetite in the morning. As their day goes by, they might eat a moderate lunch, but by dinner, they want to eat everything under the sun. Their appetite goes through the roof. They haven't consumed enough mm. fuel all day. Now they're probably trying to play catch up. At that point in time, they're over consuming. Now at that point, they haven't really regulated metabolic rate. They might have been, they're like under utilizing energy all day. And then they're just throwing a ton of food on their plate at, you know, 8 p.m. at night and then going to bed with nowhere for it to go except to turn into fat. Now, again, there are people, if they're just over consuming, a lot of times it's total blood sugar issues, in my opinion. When I can regulate and have their food more balanced, I, their hunger dissipates because now we're fueling them through the day. Now we're getting their body enough energy because to me, hunger is just a sign that your body needs something. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's energy, but if your body is like swinging all over the place, right? You eat this mass amount, you can't burn it. It goes and gets stored blood sugar drops, hunger shows up again. So regulating someone's blood sugar is a big part of the healing puzzle to try to keep them in a place where you're getting some energy throughout the day. You don't have to eat every hour, but you want to give them food that is sustainable for them. That's why we do certainly add protein in so that they can stay more regulated through the day. But um, yeah, certainly, you know, people that are over consuming, again, if you look at their diet, what is it made out of? Are they skipping meals? Right? I don't know. I don't know what you're kind of looking at. But that my experience is, if they are over consuming, it's because they're consuming, like, 70% of their calories post dinner or dinner time. Oh, well, I think most people are over consuming because they're eating the wrong foods. They're just eating processed foods and seed oils yeah. and refined grains. <laughs> yeah. And there you I go. Think, yeah. I think there's a small minority of people that you see that maybe you're doing that. And I, I don't deny that's happening at all either. That that's a certain type of thing as well is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, I think I certainly, again, I, I'm not saying that people aren't over consuming. I just think that most of their over consumption isn't happening all day long. Most people, I, my experience is that they're not eating just from the moment they wake up. They're kind of not eating enough through the day. And then they're just over consuming in the evening time. Or they're also trying to diet because I deal with a lot of those people through the week. And then on the weekends, they consume just an incredible control, amount yeah. of calories, right? So it's like that restrict and binge kind of situation. Well, I guess I, I'm more talking about most people that I hear of in just popular culture in the in the health world, the people that I've seen, people that I know, they are just kind of mindlessly eating all day and they eat from when they wake up until they go to sleep. I think that's far more common. People who see you, way more people come to see you because they did carnivore, they have thyroid problems, and now they need you and, or something. You know what I mean? But I'm saying in the general public, I think so many people, they are eating all day. And that's why I'm just trying to tease that out because I think it's super important because you're saying kind of that they should be eating more. And I'm saying, I agree with you. That's a, a perfectly good approach and pr maybe even better than restricting and trying to do only one meal a day or two, me two meals a day. But yeah. the hugest thing is what they're eating and that these people, they're Absolutely. eating from <laughs> morning to night on just bread and snacks and packaged foods and seed oils. That's right. Yeah. And I would definitely agree with that. And that's why it's like the first thing you should probably do is if you're eating 4,000 calories right now, right, then start eating 4,000 calories of better food. And that alone can probably improve your health. Right. And then it might be, you might find like, oh my God, I'm actually getting the nutrition now. So I actually don't have the appetite for 4,000 calories. I actually don't want that because we're just, <laughs> that, that's probably too much calories anyways. I think a lot of time hunger just comes from like your body's longing for nutrition. 
And so if you just give it empty, crappy calories, it's going to just continually say, I need something, I need something, I need something, because you're just lacking in any sort of nutrient density. So if you give it just better food, that alone can help somebody feel better. Then it's a matter of when are you eating? We know research will show us that even if you're eating 3000 calories, but you're eating it loaded in the evening time, right? That's why I do have people food log because they're like, I'm not eating that much. And I'm like, okay, well, let's log. And they're like, oh, you're eating like 100 calories, whatever, low in the day. And then 80% of your calories are consumed mm -hmm. at dinner and at nighttime. Yeah. And we're just setting ourselves up so I could utilize their same amount of calories or even more and just front load them and eat during the times that we're actually busy and they can lose weight not by not even changing the calories. So sometimes it's when you're eating. Obviously, if you're eating in an abundance and just eating crap all day long, <laughs> then that is also important. And that is another thing that, like again, helps people because people don't seem to think that all their snackiness counts. They're just like, bite here, bite there, some m and They're at the office. Oh, I had two candies. Oh, I had a donut. And then they just don't think, oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, but that's how we log. So we can see everything that's going on in your day. And then we can account for, again, what, what we need to do. I'm not saying it's a perfect measurement. It's not. But it can, if you're good, give us a lot of data to help us understand kind of where you're at and what we need to do. And then you can see it, right? It's a great resource, I think, for people to see on a day-to-day -day and gives them feedback on why things might be happening to them. Yeah, totally agree. That's really bad for circadian rhythm and all types of things to just eat like some giant meal at night and then go to sleep and much better to yeah, like eat it over the course of the day. Uh, don't want to. Yeah, I think snacking is bad. That's why I always want to hear more about what you have to say about eating all these frequent meals. because I think snacking is such a problem and I just haven't snacked in so many years. And it's yeah, people think it doesn't count. But I guess it really comes back to what we just said. It just matters what you're snacking on and that you probably could, you know, snack on good foods and protein and have some fruit and you could do that five meals a day and be fine. Because I think maybe you could naturally regulate your satiety better if those are the real foods. And then, yeah, maybe you can. Yeah. And I, and again, I think if somebody is healthy, they can eat two, three meals a day if they're good at sized meals and their body is able to store liver glycogen and keep them regulated totally fine, right? They can eat, do that and be totally fine. Somebody that is having blood sugar issues is super stressed, has a hard time regulating blood sugar. I don't really find that that works on a carbohydrate approach, right? It might work if somebody tries to go low carb, it might feel better initially. But from my perspective, because I'm trying to essentially get their liver to store more glycogen so they can stay regulated, but also because I want their body to utilize as much energy as possible. That's what I want to teach it to do. And, and so if you are also in a sick state, usually we can't eat really large meals. A, they just don't have the appetite for it. And B, their, their digestive system can't handle it. So we have to kind of give them smaller meals throughout the day so they don't pack too much in their system at one time. But yeah, if you are healthy, can you get away with two big meals a day? Sure. I, I, to me, I'm not against anything. If all their biomarkers and they feel good and that's working for you, do it, right? And you might change your mind as you go. And I think that's, that's what I do like about this approach. I'm like, look, we might do something, but we won't do it indefinitely, right? We might pull carbs up or our fat or protein up but to, to, to try to get a specific result, but we're not going to do that indefinitely. We might try to do, you know, whatever. It's just like training, right? You're not always training hard. You, you do deloads. It's like sleeping. You don't always stay up. You have rest. You take vacations. You have weekends off. Everything kind of goes in cycles. And I think, you know, even on a seasonal level, we can change things. Um, so I think it can change. But I think in modern society, and I think this is what's different than ancestral times, we have stress functions all the time. We have lights on all the time. We're able to stay up much later. All of these other things that are keeping us awake during times that we probably shouldn't, right? Maybe during the winter months and the ancestral times, they slept 12 to 14 hours and they had less load on them, right? Maybe they had less produce, but they just didn't do as much. It was cold. They stayed inside. There wasn't like <laughs> Netflix going on all the time, right? There wasn't all these things happening. So they could actually be fine on a different dietary approach during that, that time period. Um, so, you know, I, I think that people can survive on fat probably pretty well if they're not stressing their body 
I think that you can, if you're just laying around and doing nothing, right? Because that's our body prefers to use fat as, as fuel when we're sleeping anyways. So if you're in a rested state all day long and you don't, it's probably pretty safe. You could probably pretty do it and, and be fine, but that's not what's happening. We're in a chronic set, set, state of stress all the time and it's very different. So I, I wouldn't think that that approach would be the best, but could our ancestors do that in the winter? Very possibly. And it'd be totally fine for them. Thank you for an answering my next question already. But yeah, I mean, so the ancestral lens. So is that your idea? It does make sense. We didn't have all these plants available and that we could be, be perfectly fine on fat. And you're right. There wasn't, maybe there wasn't a lot to do and it was just cold and we we're huddling somewhere or, you know, yeah, telling I think, stories I by think fire. We all, yeah, I think we have to take things like environment into consideration. And like when your whole life is just that, right? We don't have social media. We don't have news. We don't know what goes on except for our own life. And it's cold. We don't have electricity. We aren't doing a lot. We're just laying around probably and someone's hunting, gathering, going, getting some meat for us. And right. And we have to remember too, when probably these cultures ate the meat immediately. Right. And so a lot of that meat probably had some level of glycogen stores in it. So maybe they were getting some level of carbohydrate resource just from the meat because they were getting it immediately. And so, but could they survive on that doing very little? And then of course, when summer or the light years come, they're probably doing a lot more. And that way they could get the other plants, right? A lot of our ancestors did have utilized plants during the summer years. And so they stored up and they got those and maybe they put on a little bit more body fat during that time because they're eating more or not because now they have sun. So they, maybe they're putting more muscle mass on and so forth. But I think they're busier during that time period. So I, I think we have to take all that into consideration. We don't live like that anymore. If, if we could just all, and it, we should, we probably should during the winter, like totally do less, go to bed earlier, you know, the stress of darkness, just sleep for 12 hours. You probably could get a buy with something like that. But, you know, that's normally not the case. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What if this is the recipe for living super long, super strong is do that all winter, change your diet, and then maybe eat the pro-metabolic diet all summer and be be active. And maybe that's the key and low stress. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think... I mean, my opinion is the, the, the kind of bioenergetic approach works in it, in it, and it helps mitigate the stress response of today's living much better than any other approach. If your life is very low stress and you live on your own island and you can just forage and eat fish and the sea and the fruits that are available and you're not doing anything or living that very low, then I think you can probably do, be totally fine on a variety of different diets. And, and be good because, you know, you don't have all this other things on your stress bucket per se. Um, when that is low, you can do a lot of different things. And I think, you know, some of the arguments are things like for the keto people, like when your baby's born, you know, they're, they're, they're utilizing mostly fat as energy. Okay. But a baby just doesn't do anything. It sleeps all day long and eats and craps. And then as the brain gets bigger, because the brain is a massive carbohydrate consumer and we become thinking more and doing more, then we start to utilize carbohydrates more. That's what transitions us. But yes, I mean, if we were just laying around and if you actually look at some of these kind of extreme healing approaches, the Gershon therapy, there's like a milk cure or even water fasting, the, the common thread with all of them is they require you to rest. Like they take you out of your life and they're like, we want you to do nothing but rest and be happy <laughs> and not even watch TV, right? You're not allowed to do a lot of these things. You just need to do nothing. No, no phones, nothing. And so, cause of like water approach, right? You're obviously utilizing a lot of fat cause they're just eating your own tissue, but it can probably be done sort of safely because you're not doing anything. There's not external loads on you. All right. I agree. That's, um, I agree with what you said. I, I didn't wanted to respond to you saying about why people are hungry. They just lack nutrition. At one point you said they lack energy. So that could be one of the reasons people are hungry because they're not, their body can't use energy. And then another big reason is they're just lacking nutrients. And so I just wanted to cap off this, all, all this discussion with that because I agree. So many people aren't getting the right nutrients. And so their hunger 
is always there. And it all changes when you go to nutrient dense, like real foods diet. That's about it. Anything else you got to close us off? Where can people find you? They can find me at Kate Deering Fitness on Instagram or Facebook or katedeering.com um, on my website. I have a bunch of blogs on there and a lot of other podcasts. And then they can also uh, get my book, the How to Heal Your Metabolism. It talks a lot about these concepts and tries to give it some explanation as to why this way would might work out for you. Um, cause I think it's a lot for people to kind of turn over sometimes. And so, and you do need context behind it. So you don't overdo it. Um, because this is not a here, just do this and follow this diet approach. It's a concepts and trying to utilize those concepts into your life to where you are to help you get better. Awesome. Did you see the food lies intro by any chance? Maybe I should have um, sent it to you. No. Oh man. <laughs> I just posted it on YouTube. I'm trying to get everyone fired up about it. Uh, watch it. If you're listening, go on the Food Lies YouTube channel. The intro took us a year to make while we're making this into a six-part series. I'll send it to you now. And uh, it kind of it tells a lot of what um, the film's going to be about in my story. But I'm so glad that it's taken this long to make because I'm incorporating so much new information, like all the stuff we're talking today about. And uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, so the movie's coming out soon. Hopefully. Uh, well, soon is a relative term <laughs> soon as in it's been a six year journey. And so, yes, very soon compared to how long it's been, but right. yes, it's a six part series. Now took me around the world. It's been rewritten five times and now it's just way better, I think, and really doesn't take a side on diet other than animal foods are amazing, glorious nutritious things and that processed foods are the real problem and we need to stop blaming meat for our problems and actually that's a bit of theme of the episode is stop blaming glucose for your problems or carbs fructose or glucose right that's yeah. that's kind of a thesis of the pro metabolic world right it's, it's stop blaming like carbs for what the poofas did or what your stress did or what all these weird you know additives it did or grains yeah i think when you kind of become and you only see right because i think everybody's like blood glucose it's higher and then your doctor's like you need to you know what can we do to lower your blood glucose levels everyone starts to say, well glucose is carbs and carbs are sugar that's the problem that's what's making us all fat and obese and it, i think it's a very myopic view and it's not understanding the entire organism and maybe what is happening and, and might be creating that problem and so if we just look at it that way and just take away carbohydrates, yes, you will get better blood markers. You might even lose weight and that can help you short term, maybe even years. But I think it's losing the bigger picture of why is your body doing that? And can that be corrected? Because we want to get you back to being able to utilize that very vital energy source versus just eliminating it completely. Good wrap up. Kate Daring, everyone, check her out online, Instagram, her website. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian.